again, good morning and greetings. My name is Chris. If I have not had the chance to meet you yet, I have the great honor and privilege of being able to serve as the pastor here at the church. And we just want to say thank you and good morning. And uh, again, thank you for being with us this morning. Uh, so I, I've got a question as we uh, begin this last Sunday in our teaching series called You Ask For It. So instead of y'all asking me a question, I've got a question for you, and, and in particular to uh, the men of the room, gentlemen, as we think about Mother's Day, do any of you, like I, do any of you sometimes struggle with listening? Anybody ever have a difficult time when it comes to listening? What? Somebody saw it? What? 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 I, I sometimes struggle, I was, I was thinking about Mother's Day, I was thinking about all the things that we're, we're doing. I sometimes think that in my own life, I struggle a little bit with empathetic listening, but I, I think I'm not alone. Why don't you check this video out real quick and tell me what you think. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop thing, trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing- You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Come on, if you would just- Don't! Try to see things my way Do I have to keep on talking till I can go? Not about the nail. Not about the nail. So I, I want to give a word of encouragement, not just to the gentlemen in the room, but to all of us in the room. Sometimes listening is is great. Sometimes listening is needed. Empathetic listening is something we all can work on. And in the midst of this series, one of the things that I've been working on trying to do is to listen to the heart behind the question. Like, what's the heart behind some of the questions that we have when, when we began asking these questions? And, and I'll be honest, uh, every week the stack of questions began to get bigger and bigger. And again, we don't have enough time to go through all of them. We covered a couple additional ones this past Wednesday at Bible study, and we'll pick up a few more uh, this week at Bible study in addition to what we're going to cover this morning. But as we began to, as I began to listen to the questions that were being asked. I saw things in there that I, th I think our church needs to, you know, wrestle with. Things of, you know, foundations to our Christian faith. Being reminded that Jesus Christ is in fact God. That He's the God who has always existed. That God does not have a beginning, nor does God have an end. That Jesus incarnates, takes on flesh, steps out of heaven into humanity, was born as a child, lived a perfect and sinless life, then goes to the cross, dies, three days later is resurrected. And because of what Jesus does at the cross, something amazing takes place there. We become at one with God. Atonement takes place. Jesus reconciles, brings us back into relationship with God. There's a lot of foundational elements to the questions that were asked that I do hope we as a church, as we proceed to move forward, will have an opportunity to continue to wrestle with. So trying to listen to that is going to direct some of uh, the direction that we're taking. And next week as we dive into Philippians, I'm really excited 
to spend every week throughout the summer just kind of going through some of the practical things that Paul teaches the church in Philippians. But we'll unpack that starting next week. But this morning, we continue on with our You Asked For It series. Where we've been, some of the questions that we've wrestled with have had to do with, does God pick us or do we pick God? And we said both, right? That was kind of the answer. Uh, We also looked at what it means to have a healthy prayer life, and we talked about how we, uh, we push through acts with a frog. You all remember that? Pray until something happens, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, so that we might fully rely on God. So we, we talked about some of those different things throughout the midst of these questions, but today we've got three questions that I think will be good. I, I have decided to kind of hold off on unpacking some of the conversations around hell. As I was talking with my wife, she's like, it's Mother's Day. But I'm like, I got three questions. Like, it's Mother's Day. We don't wrestle with hell on Mother's Day. <laughs> or else that might be where I'm sending you. So I said, all right. Um, <laughs> So I thought we would do something else. Carrie, Carrie actually helped me with this question because I had one thing that was there and she helped me to shape it a little bit. So, so thank you for that. Here's, here's our first question we're going to wrestle with this morning. You ready? Does God ever give us more than we can handle? Does God ever give us more than we can handle? Have you, have you ever said or had somebody say to you this statement, you know, God will never give you more than you can handle. And we own that like it's a badge of honor, thinking that's great news, that's something I can hold fast to, until we find ourselves in the midst of turmoil. Until we find ourselves in a situation that seems to be so far beyond us that we don't know what to do. And we we hear friends, and maybe nicely, trying to encourage us, you know, hey, God will, God will never give you more than you can handle. And, and I was thinking, uh, question, and, and in thinking through this question, I was reminded of a near and dear friend of Carrie and I's, uh, somebody who, uh, through the ministry that I was privileged to lead back in Claremont, began to come to church, and this husband and wife began to uh, wrestle with and own their faith. They have two children and found out that they were pregnant with a third child. And it was a joyous occasion. We got with them and they had told us we're we're pregnant and we celebrated and we loved them and we prayed over them. And through the pregnancy, uh, this sweet young lady came to find out that there were some complications. And she was given some choices you guys watch the news right now? There's a lot of conversations about some of these choices going on right now, but that's a different sermon for a different day. But they were given some, some clar- clarifications about what would in fact happen if she carried full term. And somebody thought they were doing something nice, saying, you know, God would never give you more than you could handle. You must be really, 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 really strong. And I remember sitting and talking with her and her telling me how weak she felt in the midst of this. And I absolutely love this family. And they carry, they, I say they, but he had nothing to do with it, right? Um, she, on Mother's Day, <laughs> she carried that young child all the way, and we prayed for a miracle. And one of the other pastors of the, the other church and myself were there the day she gave birth, and um, she got to hold her, her son for a few moments before he passed. Um, I'll tell you, that was the most difficult funeral I've ever done. Um, I don't cry very often, um, but I was, a, I was a, a, a hot mess that day. I think one of the things we need to be reminded of is that God does, in fact, at times, give us more than we can handle. And we see it with even a mother in the Bible. If you have your Bible in the Gospel of Luke, we're going to look at Mary, the mother of Jesus. In Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 34, it says this, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel sent, was sent from God 
to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But what was Mary's response? She was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of, of his kingdom there shall be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I've never been intimate with a man? Put yourself in Mary's shoes for just a moment. You're a young lady. You are somewhere between the ages of 12 and 15, 16. And all of a sudden, a giant flying angel dressed in white, dazzling, probably about 35 feet tall. I don't know what an angel looked like. But an angel shows up to Mary, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, tells her some news. Guess what, Mary? We know that you're not married. We know that you live in a culture of honor and shame. We know that the world is going to look at you as though you are some sort of societal pariah. At best, you'll be shunned. At worst, you'll be stoned. And guess what? You're going to be, become pregnant and you're going to be a mother. So place yourself in Mary's shoes. Do you think by chance she was a little overwhelmed? Do you think that she was a little nervous? Do you think that she was scared, frightened? Use whatever descriptor you need. Do you think that Mary was sitting in that going, oh my goodness, what is happening? I think in that moment, Mary was probably thinking that God was about to do something in her life that was beyond her control. Does God give us more than we can handle? Did God give Mary more than she could handle? Yeah, probably. Her family all of a sudden was now going to look at her as though there's a strain in that relationship. She's engaged to a man, and he and his family are going to look at her like there's some strain in this relationship. Thanks we got hindsight into the story, and we, we know that Joseph is also visited by an angel, and Joseph loves Mary well, and they raise this child whose name is Jesus, and we uh, have been shaped and defined by this same Jesus who is God. Thanks be to God for that. But in this moment, Mary is probably thinking God is giving her more than she can handle. But one of the things that I've come to realize is that God never said he would give us more than we could handle. There will be times when things in life feel too big for us. But let's be honest. If we could handle everything on our own that comes our way, why then do we need God at all? If we could pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, if we could take on this world all by ourselves, and if we were sufficient enough to overcome every trial and tribulation, every good deed, every bad deed, every good day, every bad day, if we could do it all on our own, why do we need God? You see, I think there will be days in our lives where God will in fact give us more than we can handle. But God will never give us more than He can handle through us. And that's the difference. You see, if we are in Christ, we have been marked by the Holy Spirit who lives and resides within our life. And if the Holy Spirit of God is present and active in our lives, then God will never give us more than He can handle in and through us. Because it's not dependent upon our strength, our might, our willpower. It's not dependent upon us. But it's dependent upon God. And He will show up and He will give us strength and He will see us through. And in addition to Him being present, He'll begin to surround us with the folks who will help us to walk through those moments of weakness. 
God stitches together family, whether blood or water. God stitches together family, church families, friends who are thicker than blood. So back to our friends that day in the hospital, it was hard. It was so hard for them. But you know what what God did do in the midst of it all? Is he surrounded them with church family. That where they were weak and could not do this on their own, God was active and present in their life. And God surrounded them with a church family who loved them unconditionally. And to this day still loves them unconditionally. It's been a few years now, and we still call, we still pray, we still talk to, we still care about. They loved this church family, believe it or not. They showed up and came to service here at some point. They helped us unload pumpkins at the pumpkin patch. We love them. They love you. They've walked through hard things, but God has strengthened them so that when they could not do it on their own, God was present and walked with them through it. Second question. Why, in the Lord's Prayer, does it say, lead us not into temptation? Why, in the Lord's Prayer, does it say, lead us not into temptation? The follow-up question is, would God really lead us into temptation? Would God really lead you or I into temptation? Well, let's look at the Lord's Prayer in the book of Matthew. If you you got a Bible, Matthew 6, 9 through 13 is where we find the Lord's Prayer. It says this, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's interesting. Why would the Lord's Prayer say, lead us not into temptation? Why doesn't it say something like, and Remove all temptation from us. Right? That would be a better prayer, right? Not lead us not into temptation, but God, remove all temptation so that I do not fall victim to sin. Remove all temptation so that when I get home, I don't go to the cookies and eat all the cookies. Because, right, those are temptation. Right? My waistline does not need another cookie. But some of us, we think, like, why would God, in the midst of this prayer, use the language of, and lead us to, instead of fully remove? I think Jesus had in his mind a really famous psalm as he was teaching his disciples to pray. Do you guys know the words of Psalm 23? Well, let's, let's look at it real quick, just to remind us. It says, and the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk... Wait, time out. Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, We shall fear no evil, for you, God, are with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In Psalm 23, we are told that each and every one of us at some point in our life will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We will walk through moments of temptations. We will walk through moments of trials. We will walk through moments that are good, that are bad, that are hard. We're all going to face those days, right? I would imagine that all of us not only will face those days, but have faced those days. If you're older than maybe just two or three years, if you're old enough, you've faced some tough days, amen? You get into elementary school, there's some tough days. It's this thing called homework. It's tough. You get into middle school, it's this thing called puberty. It's tough. 
You get into high school, and all of a sudden it's still difficult because now you have to take tests and you have to do well so that you can get scholarships, so that you can go to college, so that you can get a career, so that you can start a life, you can have a family, so on and so forth. Life is difficult no matter how young or how old. We all will walk through the valley of the shadow of death at some point in time. But what does God encourage us? Just as in Psalm 23 and with the Lord's Prayer, we are promised that God is present with us. That there is no trial nor tribulation that we will walk through that God is not present with us. Listen, Jesus understands how to deal in your life with temptation because in his life he was tempted as well. In Matthew 4, 1 and 2, we find that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness and he was tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days, this was a food fast. He didn't fast from water. You can't go 40 days without water, but you can go 40 days without food. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. See, Jesus was led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness to be tempted. Why was Jesus tempted? So that he might understand how to empathize with us when we are tempted. That when temptation comes our way, and temptation is in and of itself not sin. It might lead us unto sin, but temptation in and of itself is not sin. But if we are led into temptation and we give into temptation and temptation gives into sin, we have done wrong. But if we understand that we are being tempted and that God is our strength and He is ever present and He walks with us through every valley and every trial and every tribulation and He understands how to see us through, then the goal is to walk with Jesus through those moments of tribulation, through those moments of temptation. It's not a moment to turn off our mind, close our eyes, ignore God, and be like, I got this! Because if it's left to us, we're going to fail. But if we invite God in, if we say, come Lord quick, that when temptation comes our way, then God will walk with us and see us through. I want to share one encouragement. I don't think I have the scripture for this, but this is from Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says this, when it comes to temptation... No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, He will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. That when temptation comes your way, God will provide a way out. Remember in high school, uh, a bunch of buddies of, of I, for a period of time, were doing some things that we should not have been doing. That was pretty much my high school career. And in particular, freshman and sophomore year, some of the things that we should not be doing um, involved little green things that you would put in a pipe, and we won't go there. But I remember my sophomore year of high school being with a, a group of friends going, you know, at this point, I think God was just beginning to uh, allow His provenient grace to have its way with me because it wasn't until my junior year of high school that I became a Christian, but sophomore year is the year I stopped smoking. And what really happened was is every opportunity that I had to go with friends and do things, being tempted to give in to sin, towards that point, God was providing a way out. And I had to start looking at the fact that every chance that I was trying to give into the temptation, God was providing an exit from the temptation. You know, when we are tempted to sin, Paul is reminding us that God is also providing a way out of sin. That when temptation comes our way, God is providing a path so that we don't give into it. For some of us today, we just need to open our eyes and see where God is leading us away from the temptation. That might be the best thing we can do today. One last question. You ready? This is the doozy. You thought those were bad. This is, this is the tough one. Here we go. How do we give forgiveness to someone who's hurt us? You know, every time I've done a question series, whether with youth, young adults, or adults, there's always a question about forgiveness that is asked. 
It's amazing. This is a universal constant. Transcends culture, transcends age, transcends community. We're all looking for an understanding of how we can be better at forgiving. Amen? You know, some of us today walked in with some baggage, maybe around Mother's Day. Maybe some of us don't have the best relationships with mom. Not that I'm saying today's the day to run out of here and call mom up and offer forgiveness, but maybe today's the day we run out of here and we start to think about what it would look like to offer forgiveness. You know, forgiveness is a process. Forgiveness is not accepting wrongs that have been done and saying that it is okay. Forgiveness is not forgetting as though nothing has happened. Forgiveness is the ability for us to maybe close one chapter in a book and move on to the next. We know that it's there. We know that it's happened. We know that we're in the midst of some bad days, but forgiveness frees us so that we can move on to the next chapter. In Ephesians 4, 32 through 5, 2, it says this. It says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So what, what exactly is biblical forgiveness? Biblical forgiveness is essentially God's way of removing the great obstacle of our fellowship with God. By canceling our sin and paying for it with the death and resurrection of His Son, God opens the way for us to see Him, know Him, and enjoy Him forever. Now, what's the root motivation for a person who needs to offer forgiveness? Well, it's that call from God to forgive one another as God and Christ forgave you. Listen, you are a forgiven individual. God has seen your life from the first day to the last. He has seen the good things that you have done and He has seen the bad things that you have done. And God does not stop loving you. When Jesus goes to the cross, He dies to forgive our sins. Every last one of them. He sees them all. And there is no sin that disqualifies you from the love and the forgiveness of God. He sees them all. He forgives them all. And if we are forgiven individuals... We become imitators of God by being forgiving individuals. You have been called to forgive as God has forgiven you. Now think about it in your own life. Think about maybe some of the dumb things that you have done. Some of the sinful things that you have done. Some of the things that in your life seem to preclude you from the love of God or maybe from the love of others. If you think about those things in your mind, Remember that you have been forgiven of those things in Christ. Those things do not preclude you from a relationship with God because Jesus has paid the penalty for them in full. So hear me again. You are forgiven. And if you are a forgiven individual, then we are to be forgiving as we have been forgiven. God forgave us in such a way that infinite joy in His fellowship, becomes ours. And God then becomes the goal of our forgiveness. The motivation that we need for being a forgiven person is to understand that when we live like God, we find joy in living like God. It doesn't seem joyful to offer forgiveness sometimes, does it? Sometimes we want to be those who, who, who enact vengeance. Like, we think, you've hurt me, I have the right to hurt you. Like, I saw it this morning, even among my kids, one of them smacked the other one, and the other one was ready to just, got this. Just. We think eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But if we live that mentality, we're going to have a whole lot of blind and toothless individuals. We're not going to see, nor are we going to eat. If we've experienced forgiveness... 
as the free and undeserved gift from God, a gift of joy, then we should be carriers of that joy, living with His love, and going forth into a world of sin and suffering by extending grace and hope. Again, forgiveness is not the same as acceptance. So some of us maybe have difficult relationships where there's things like you know, verbal, emotional, spiritual, psychological, physical abuse. Forgiveness is not accepting the wrong that has been done to you. It's not saying, I see what you've done. It's all good. We're great. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is not cheap. Forgiveness is costly. It costs God everything. Our forgiveness to others is not cheap, just freely thrown, away, thrown around. But it's costly to us because it's a bridge that's been broken. And when forgiveness is give, given, it's a bridge that's being rebuilt. But how do you rebuild a bridge? Just one brick at a time. Forgiveness does not mean everything is good, everything is great tomorrow. It means it's a process of moving forward. So how do we tangibly in our lives begin to offer forgiveness to others? Seven points. And I'm just going to riddle them off real quick. First, we find help with God. We can't offer forgiveness on our own. We need God to help us. Second, we openly admit in the areas of our life where we are not offering forgiveness. We confess to God our areas of unforgiveness. And we allow the Holy Spirit to do the work. Third, we remember that we have been forgiven. If God could forgive every last one of our sins, and we're called to be an imitator of God, we're called to remember how much we've been forgiven of. So that point four, we could give forgiveness. One of the most difficult points is to actually do it. Not to just speak about it, but to actually do it. Five, it must be, and I'm going to use air quotes, so hear me, it must be forgotten. By that I mean it's not held over the other person. Because sometimes we offer forgiveness, but we don't ever let them forget that we've forgiven them. And we use it as a, hey, you remember this that you did? Hey, you remember that? Like, no, we forget it. We don't actually ever forget the wrong that's been done, right? But we can move past it. Sixth, vengeance is not part of forgiveness. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. It is not ours. And seven, eventually, eventually work to reestablish relationship. For some of us, that's, that will be possible. For others of us, that won't be possible. Sometimes the people we need to forgive are not even with us anymore. And we need to offer forgiveness so that we can be freed of the burden and the hurt and the pain that dwells within our hearts. We need to offer that so that we might move forward we might need to offer it so that somebody else can move forward. But eventually, if, if it is possible, again, it won't always be possible, but eventually, if it is possible, work towards reestablishing relationship again. I'm going to invite our band to come back up this morning, and as they do, we're going to pray um, over our time and over our, our questions. I want to say thank you to all of our church family who's given questions throughout the series. Like I said, on Wednesday evening, we'll dive in and we'll explore a few more. We will continue to unpack these. But for those who have poured out their hearts to ask, to seek, to grow, thank you. We'll revisit the series at a later date and time. We'll look for new questions. There will be new things that will come to our hearts and to our minds. But let's go back in thought to the beginning of this message. We were challenged to, to listen empathetically. Mother's Day is an opportunity for us to listen to moms, to hear their wisdom, to hear their grace, to hear their stories, 
to hear their hearts. When we ask questions, it gives us the opportunity to uh, hush up and listen. So church, my challenge to you today is just that. May we hush up after we ask some good questions so that we might listen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, today that as we began to look through these questions, difficult questions, being reminded that God, while we may be given more than we can handle, we're never given more than you could handle in and through our lives. So remind us that you are present with us And Lord, when we think of the temptations that come our way, remind us that you give us grace and you give us strength so that there is no temptation you do not provide a way out of because you walk with with us into every temptation and into every trial. And Lord, today for any of us, any of us who's struggling with the area of unforgiveness, Lord, we pray that you would begin to have your will and your way with our lives. Lord, remind us of how much we've been forgiven so that we might live like you, Jesus, and be a forgiving individual. So Jesus, we love you. We thank you. We praise you for the good and loving and gracious God that you are. Bless us today in your name. And hear us as we pray. Amen.